Human. Les humains à leur meilleur. <rire> C'est toi pour Héo. Hi again, everyone. Another week has begun. We've slipped into season seven without a break in the action. There's no time for a pause. There's so many interesting people to talk to. If you're new to this podcast, I'm Brian Sanders, and I'm making a film called Food Lies that goes to the beginning of human history to find out what we should be eating. We go through all the bad science that has led us astray, the new science that vindicates ancestral eating, and we even get into how we can eat meat in a not only sustainable way, but one that is regenerative to the environment. All these topics have been covered in the last 83 episodes of this podcast, so please start back at episode one. Today, Dr. Paul Mason and I get into a wide variety of topics, including salt, blood pressure, lectins, gluten, intestinal permeability, the microbiome, fiber myths, autoimmune issues, animal-based diets, and we end on how this all lines up with staying healthy and protecting yourself from viruses like COVID-19. Get out your notepad for this one. Dr. Mason is a sport exercise medicine physician specialist. He obtained his medical degree with honors from the University of Sydney and his degrees in physiotherapy and occupational health. He works with a variety of patients from the general public to elite athletes from teams such as Penrith Panthers, Sydney FC, and the Australian men's water polo team. He also presents at conferences around the world. Become a producer of the show on Patreon by searching for Peak Human there or going to patreon.com slash peak human. This show is made possible entirely by listeners like you. I really appreciate this model and us making it happen as a team with only a few bucks here and there. Find out about everything else at sapien.org and join the newsletter there to stay in tune with the new announcements and other special features we're offering to the Sapien tribe. Everyone knows about the great meat we deliver at nosetail.org by now. We're selling out each week, so jump on it Friday midday to Sunday night to make sure we can get it out Monday or Tuesday morning. Here's Dr. Paul Mason. All right. Hello, Dr. Paul Mason. How are you doing? Super good. Thanks, Brian. All right. Great to hear. Uh, so, yeah, I know you're out in Sydney. How's it going over there? Look, well, we're uh, just sort of slowly emerging from lockdown. We've got some beautiful weather. Given our current situation, life is good. That's great to hear. Yeah, I think we might be opening some trails over here in Los Angeles. I can do some hikes finally. But, uh, yeah, things are looking good so far. Uh, yeah, it was interesting that we were on the same flight almost two years ago. And you're coming from Sydney, supposedly, and I was coming from L.A., and we got on a flight to Ohio for that conference. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was uh, I was sitting right next to your camera guy. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. You know, it's, uh, you know, it was uh, finally good to make it onto your podcast after, well, that's two years ago now. Yeah. Well, since then, I've seen a lot of your presentations and been following your work, and it's great. You've covered a lot of topics, so I want to get into a lot of those, including the coronavirus stuff, and maybe we can get it to the end, but I don't know. Where should we start here? Well, look, it's morning here, and I've sort of just woken up, and I've you know just been checking the news, and I just woke up to the headline, and it said, new blood pressure guidelines call for low-salt diets. Nothing gets my goat more than this kind of bad science, bad guideline, bad advice. I mean, there's absolutely no substantiation for this. So I thought, well, why don't we perhaps talk about some of the misinformation that comes out of our, our nutritional guidelines and our health guidelines and maybe how we can cut through that and, you know, work out what really matters. I love that. It's funny because I thought that story was dead. <laughs> you know, I thought we figured out the salt thing a long time ago. And it's weird that this is coming back. What is their point? Like, what are they trying to say? Well, the scientists worked it out. The scientists know this stuff. I mean, their point is, uh, I don't know that it matters what their point is more than what their agenda is and mm. why they're actually doing it. So, I mean, if we go back to September 2017, uh, the Australian Dietary Guidelines issued a revision where they removed the upper limit of recommended salt intake for individual Australians. Mm. And that was done on by quite comprehensive evidence and quite comprehensive science because we know that blood pressure in and of itself is more determined by insulin level than by sodium level. 
So the job of sodium is to hold on to fluid in the blood vessels. Um, without the sodium, you can't actually hold on to the volume or the fluid and your blood pressure will drop. But the amount of sodium that ends up in your body is more controlled by insulin because the job of insulin in the kidneys is to hold on to the sodium. If you have a very high level of insulin, then your body's going to hold on to much more of that sodium. And if you have a low level of insulin, as in on a ketogenic diet, you'll lose more of that sodium. So that brings us to the point, if you actually want to lower your blood pressure, if you literally halve the amount of sodium you're eating based on the standard Western diet to what the guidelines, approximating what the guidelines would want, your blood pressure would drop by about two millimetres of mercury, which is a <laughs> unit of measurement for blood pressure. It's absolutely token. And we have a look at the blood pressure drops you can have on ketogenic diets, and it's quite literally an order of magnitude above that. We can get massive drops in blood pressure. So, and if you look at the literature, the doctors that know this describe essential hypertension, which is the garden variety, that's what everybody's got, as an insulin-dependent condition. So this whole thing about, oh, you have to cut the salt out of your diet to lower your blood pressure for your health is wrong on so many levels. So I had a patient yesterday I was consulting with online, and he was concerned that he had a blood pressure of 140, and he was trying to get it down to 120. So the first question I ask is, well, hang on, where's the evidence that a systolic blood pressure, that's the top number, of mm -hmm. 140 is actually problematic? So if we go back to uh, a paper that was published in June of 2018 in the British Medical Journal, they found the minimum mortality was probably closer to 129 or 130. And in actual fact, if you looked at it, the line was pretty flat between 120 and 140. And then if you take into account statistical significance, they found that there was not a clear increase in mortality risk until your systolic blood pressure was 154. So, and this was a, you know, quite a large study. So then the question is, so this gentleman I was consulting with, with a blood pressure of 140, does he actually need to try and bring it down to 120? Will that actually confer a benefit with regards to his mortality risk? And I would probably suggest, you know, based on the data, possibly not. Mm. This isn't just a, you know, a problem with any metric that we are using to measure our health. You've probably had a bunch of blood tests done before, Brian. Mm -hmm. And when you get them back, you see you've got these numbers down the side, the reference range. And most people's understanding of this reference range is that that reflects optimal health, that you need to be between those goalposts to be healthy. But what most people don't realize is that these markers aren't set based on health metrics. They're set basically statistically to represent, in most cases, what 95% of the population will be having. So this is basically assuming that 95% of the population is healthy. But we know that 70% of our populations in the US and Australia are overweight. And in one study where they looked at metabolic health based on five markers, they found that only 12% of US adults were healthy. So if we've sort of got, you know, somewhere between 12 and 30% of the population potentially being healthy, why on God's green earth are we using markers that assume that 95% are healthy? So you can be way outside this range because you're healthier than average and you'll have an abnormal result, or you could be smack banging the middle of the range and be unhealthy because you're just unhealthy just like everybody else. It's crazy. I just had a debate and someone else had me on their podcast and was trying to tell me about these studies we've done and all this type of stuff. And I'm saying, why are you believing all these studies when I said the exact same thing, when 88% of the people are unhealthy? We can't look at everything under this context of this is what we want to be when I don't want to be like 88% of Americans. So going back to the patient you were seeing, there's so much more context is maybe high blood pressure is bad in certain contexts if he's eating a bad diet or if he's obese, but maybe that's not what he was or maybe there's other things to consider. So it's mostly we don't take context correctly, it seems like, in a lot of medicine. A hundred percent correct. For example, if we're looking at a blood test, um, say B12, people on animal-based diets routinely will come back with very high levels of B12 on their blood test. I've seen articles out recently that saying uh, high B12 levels are bad, they're, they're bad. And they can be bad 
in somebody, say, on a vegetarian or a vegan diet who's not getting B12 in their diet, if they had high B12 levels in their bloodstream, that would be bad. And let me explain why. It comes down to your point about the context because B12 is stored in the liver. So if you have a liver disease that's destroying your hepatocytes, your liver cells, that could be releasing the B12 into the circulation. In somebody with active liver disease, a high B12 is definitely a problem. But in somebody who's just got high B12 levels because they have such a nutrient-dense diet, that is not a problem at all. So it all comes down, as you said, to the context. It's like iron, ferritin. So most doctors will look at uh, something called ferritin to assess whether a patient has sufficient iron or not. And ferritin is the molecule in which iron is stored. But it doesn't mean that your body can actually use the iron because if your body's inflamed, we've evolved to actually try and prevent pathogens like bacteria from accessing that iron as well because it makes it easier for our immune system to eradicate. It really matters whether you're inflamed or not. If you're inflamed and you have a high level of iron, well, that doesn't mean dork because your body probably cannot access that iron. But if you have very low levels of inflammation and you have a moderate level of iron in your blood, that's absolutely fine because there's enough iron there and your body can access that. So the context about your iron levels depends on your inflammatory state. And unfortunately, too few health professionals actually look at the nuance and the context of some of these results. It's all black and white. It's dichotomous. It's like you fall in the reference range or you don't fall in the reference range. And things get even worse. So I got a uh, notification from one of the pathology labs that I use a, a while back, and they said, look, uh, this marker that we use to assess for liver health, we abbreviate it ALT, we've changed the reference range. And of course, they had moved it up. So understand what this enzyme represents. So this is an enzyme that is typically found inside the liver cells. It's found inside some other cells as well, like muscle cells, but it's predominantly inside liver cells. And if your liver is sick or dying, these cells are basically, the cell walls are being disrupted and some of these chemicals are able to leak out into the blood and we can stick a needle into a vein and take a sample of blood and we say, oh, you've got higher levels than we expect of this marker that is highly suggestive that your liver is actually being actively damaged at this time. So when the population started having more liver disease and they started getting less healthy, do you think the the response was to say, well, we have a population health problem here. We need to actually find out what's going on. What's causing all of this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? You know, can we fix it? Or do we just say, well, let's just move the goalposts a little bit so all of these people that are abnormal now become normal again? Well, clearly, they just move the goalposts. I've seen this in other parameters as well. It's not just ALT. This is a standard response to an unhealthy population. They do that with LDL. Didn't they do that with statins so that they could basically prescribe more statins, is like lower the threshold? Yeah. So when I was in medical school, we quite literally got taught the saying, as low as it goes. You know, so well, what should a target be? And they're just saying, as low as you can push it down, the lower, the better. They didn't even want us to have a target. They basically just wanted you to have the patient on the highest dose statin possible they could tolerate without side effects. But it certainly is true that these uh, there has been a degree of influence in uh, sort of pushing down some of these target levels, absolutely. And it's not evidence-based. And this is the whole problem. We, we're having some of these metrics. And some of you, the doctors, Doctors don't realize this themselves. And this is not part of the standard medical curriculum that we get taught. Unless you actually take it upon yourself to go and look at the literature with respect to hard endpoints, and this is really easy to do. So all your listeners have to do, if say to take the previous example of ALT, is Google ALT and all-cause mortality. So we like all-cause mortality because that's an objective endpoint researchers can't massage it in a way that they often do to get the result they want. It's dichotomous. You're dead or you're not dead. So all-cause mortality is a brilliant uh, metric to use. And then uh, click on an image search and you'll see these graphs that come up and they will show you 
you know, optimal levels. And you'll see the point, the nadir or the low point of that graph, which will usually be associated with the lowest level of mortality, it'll be called hazard ratio or something like that. And you'll be very clearly able to determine the optimal levels for that parameter uh, associated with optimal health. And that will be very, very different to the reference range that's given on your blood test. That's crazy. It's all kind of the same story where, okay, we were healthy hunter gatherers, right? And we maybe we had these high iron levels and we had the right salt levels and we had the right the certain cholesterol levels. Then we went away from that. And then now all the science has been done under this new paradigm. And now all the doctors learn the same thing. And even if it's changing, it's changing kind of in the wrong way. Like you're saying, we're changing these reference ranges in the wrong direction. And now if you challenge these doctors or you challenge the paradigm, you're all of a sudden anti-scientific and crazy. So I'm on a group text message today. Well, I'm always on this group text message with a bunch of my friends. And many of them are doctors, actually. Some doctors, like Dr. Gary, who people know who are listening, regular listeners that I'm business partner with, is trying to say, you can't just take everything that we've put out in the healthcare system and in the studies as fact. There's always something that's changing or we find new information. And everyone else in this text message just thinks that he's insane for questioning things or saying that it's okay to eat a piece of steak. So what, what, what do we do? Let me give you some examples about how exactly the wool has been pulled over the public's eyes and, dare I say, the medical profession's eyes because, you know, one thing I will say is doctors don't set out to harm people or to give people bad information. I think that's just a manifestation of what we've been taught ourselves. So, you know, if we're looking at the debate between saturated fat and polyunsaturated fat, well, there's been more than 10 systematic reviews and meta-analysis on this topic, and they, on balance, they find in favour of saturated fat. And then, you know, people say, well, you know, what about long-term randomised control trials and so on and so forth? And it's like, well, there's been three. And, you know, some of your listeners may have heard me talk about this, but this one that I'll talk about now of Just yesterday, I got some new information about. So it was called the Sydney Diet Heart Study, and that ran between 1966 and 1973. And that was a randomised trial that looked at what happened when you replace saturated fat in the diet with polyunsaturated fat. Um, But the problem was it took 40 years for the results to actually officially be published. And that was simply because a research group in America actually went and tracked down the original study data and said, well, this was an important study. We should actually publish the findings and see, you know, not just publish piecemeal, cherry pick a little bit, a little bit there. And when they finally published the results 40 years later, they found that those men who were given the polyunsaturated fat or the vegetable oil they were 62% more likely to die than the men having saturated fat. Now, yesterday I received a phone call from somebody with very solid information and what I was told, which is not public information, was that this study was actually sponsored by a very well-known margarine company. And the question is, does that explain why the results were not published for 40 years and why it actually it, it required the son of the lead investigator years afterwards to go through his personal possessions and actually find these old magnetic tapes and these old, uh, th- these old documents? And, and if that was never done, this would have been lost to, to science. And this is a blatant, I don't know if you call it a cover-up or what, what have you, but there's clear evidence in a large-scale randomised control trial of the harms of introducing polyunsaturated fat into the diet. And this is not an isolated incident. So the Minnesota Coronary Survey, which ran between 1968 to 1973, well, that was a double-blinded randomised control trial, super good quality, more than 9,000 men and women, again, comparing saturated fat and polyunsaturated fat diets. And, again, the full results weren't published until, uh, I think, uh, 2016. 16 years um, later, yeah. No, you know, to, what, no, or over 40 years. Oh, right? reevaluated. I was just actually looking at this one, too. 
because I'm doing this part of the Food Lies film right now. Everyone keeps asking when it's going to come out. <laughs> yes, yeah, so where the 16 years come from is that the initial publication mm. was published after 16 years. Mm, okay. However, that was incomplete. So the complete data set wasn't then fully published until 2016. Mm. So the study con- concluded in 1973 with the full results published in 2016. And uh, what did that find? Well, that also found that, you know, taking polyunsaturated fats did lower cholesterol levels, but that also increased the risk of death. And then we have the Women's Health Initiative, which was a massive study. Over 48,000 females were randomised to a low-fat or a control group, and that cost over $70,000. And what that found is that the females who were put in the low-fat group, if they had a history of heart issues, then they had a 26% higher chance of cardiovascular complications, you know, meaning things like having a heart attack. And the problem is that even though this was a relative, you know, in the modern era, the result was not put in the conclusion. It wasn't published in the results table. It was never discussed in any of the numerous press conferences. Instead, it was buried in obscure text on page 661 of the publishing journal in a sentence that unless you're medically and statistically minded, you would have no idea what it meant. And the question is, why? If you pay $700 million to do a study, surely you must have a little bit of editorial competence there. I mean, this seems like it, given that there was only one statistically significant finding in the whole study, you would think that would be the most important finding to communicate. So, it would be hard to make a case that this was a simple oversight. Yeah, there's always an agenda. And like you said, with the margin funding, that's an agenda. And some people's agenda is just it goes against their beliefs. So it's not necessarily an overt agenda. And I don't think anyone's trying to harm anyone. But there's always these personal agendas or I have this hypothesis. And if it goes against that, I don't necessarily want to tell the world. And also, we should say in the Minnesota coronary experiment, they asked the lead author why they didn't publish it. Famously, I actually was just reading Gary Taub's book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. And I think it's mentioned in mm-hmm. Nina Teichel's book as well. They, he said, why did you publish it? They said, because the conclusions we got were just so disappointing. They weren't what we they wanted. They didn't get the result they wanted. But there's more to this story. Do you know who was originally a co-investigator on that Minnesota coronary survey? No. Ansel Keys. No. Oh. Oh, maybe I did know that. Yeah. Wow. So if you're talking about we didn't get the result, we want it. Well, clearly, this really poses a problem, though, for the public because we're saying, well, the information, the scientific information coming out, the dietary advice is coming out. That you have to question what's happening with fat. You have to question what's happening with salt. You even have to question when your doctor says you are or are not healthy based on you know your test results. You have to question the accuracy of that. So I think it really puts the public in quite an invidious position. Yeah. And we should just wrap up the salt thing too, because it's very related with the salt thing. You're talking it's more insulin is way a bigger factor. And people have been eating processed foods. We've been telling them to eat processed foods. The food industry took over ever since we gave these bad dietary guidelines. The average Americans eating all these highly processed foods with a bunch of salt in it. So even if salt is a problem, it's more of a problem because it's a proxy for people eating processed foods. Well, it is a problem. I would argue one. Maybe it's not the problem or the processed foods I meant. It's like all it's saying is you're eating highly processed foods with, you know, seed oils and all kinds of other things in them. And they happen to some of them have a lot of salt. But the real problem is the insulin resistance. And yes. Exactly. That's what I meant. And we go back to 2014. There was a large study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, again, one of the most preeminent medical journals in the world. And they looked at sodium intake, but they did it quite cleverly because nobody knows how much sodium you have. But the amount of sodium coming out in your urine over time is a reasonably good proxy for how much sodium is coming in. There's some other losses through sets on and so forth, but basically most of it is in the urine. So they had uh, about 102,000 subjects across 17 countries, and they followed them up on average for 3.7 years. And they actually found if your salt intake was too low, then that was more problematic in terms of increasing your chance of uh, of dying than if your salt intake 
well, sodium intake was too high. Now, I should just uh, clarify here. So when we talk about sodium and salt, so salt is generally used to refer to table salt, which is a mixture of sodium and chloride. And sodium itself is just that fraction of table salt, which we actually really care about. And that forms about 40% of the weight of table salt. So they actually found in this study that the lowest risk of dying was at about four to six grams a day of sodium, which means then you multiply that by about two and a half to get the equivalent salt intake, which means that you know, we're really wanting people to have, ideally based on this study, that saying that a salt intake of more than 10 grams a day, that is way over what our guidelines say. But this is probably the best data we've got. This is the, the most scientific data we've got. And fortunately, this is probably why uh, the Australian dietary guidelines have removed the upper limit of salt intake for an individual. But I will add a caveat here. They still maintain that there should be a population limit, which makes no sense. So the difference is they're saying, if you are, Brian, if you as a person want to have a lot of salt, that's absolutely fine. Fill your boots no issues. But everybody around you, your community, on average, you should set yourself a threshold here. And clearly that makes no sense. And they made this population recommendation with the theory that that restriction would lower average blood pressure by two millimetres of mercury, clearly a, a, you know, a, a near pointless amount. And to me, this just points out that there must have been two groups arguing the science behind the scenes when they were formulating this revision, and this is probably just a compromise. It's a totally illogical compromise. Uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too, so to say. You've either got to say salt is good or salt is not good, and instead they've just tried to hedge their bets. And this is good um, for me as a doctor because it means that I can actually now advocate for true evidence-based medicine in my patients with regards to salt intake, and I'm protected. But it also serves the purpose of you know, potential uh, large-based organisations like the, you know, who will remain nameless, who want to continue advocating a lower salt intake on a population basis and come out with these ridiculous guidelines saying that people should be on low-sodium diets to uh, lower their blood pressure. So it certainly is a conflict and I'd hope that it will be resolved, you know, in the next iteration of the dietary guidelines and I hope it's resolved based on science. Yeah, that's great. I mean, they are discussing the 2020 guidelines right now. And you did just talk about the saturated fat part. What do you think that what's going to happen with these new guidelines and saturated fat? Unfortunately, it looks like it's a very, shall we say, select committee of people who are going to be making the decision. And I'm not sure that it's a scientifically transparent process. So I'm not optimistic. Yeah, well, that's too bad. I've always wanted sort of pattern A and pattern B type of approach to diet because I think it's kind of crazy to just recommend one diet. And I don't think they're ever going to switch over all of a sudden and be like, oh, yeah, high fat diets are great. Low carb diets are great. But do you think there's an option where we can kind of promote two dietary patterns? And there's this idea that I talk about a lot is not getting caught in the middle, right? Most Americans or Western societies are... I think like right? about diets... I don't like to think in terms of a dichotomy mm. where it's black or a white, it's on or it's off. I prefer to think in terms of a continuum. Mm. Uh, and by that, I mean it, it's dose dependent. So for some people, you know, for instance, if they wanted to be metabolically healthy, you, we know that insulin resistance is the root cause of metabolic illness. Some people, based on their lifestyle and their genetics, would be able to maintain healthy insulin sensitivities at quite a high level of carbohydrate intake, you know, 100 grams a day more. Whereas other people who have perhaps been metabolically damaged might require a carbohydrate intake of 20 grams or 30 grams a day, much, much lower. So this is not reflecting a dichotomous difference that some people can eat carbs and some people can't. It reflects a, a difference in threshold of how much you actually need to restrict it. The same is also true of uh, things like uh, lectin intake. So these are carbohydrate binding proteins that are found um, in foods and the plant lectins can actually be damaging to our health. But we know that some people have a tolerance for these, um, likely genetically related, and other people do not. 
So I think rather than talking about a A and B, I tend to think of it in terms of a uh, a scale, uh, just a, a continuum, and you just have to work out whereabouts on that continuum you exist. You know, can you have this amount of carbohydrates? Um, some people actually don't seem to be affected by gluten, very few, but some people get away with having bread and these kind of things. And for those people, if they get enjoyment from it and it's not adversely impacting on their health, go for your life. But certainly there is a degree of dose dependency to that. So I'll use an example of uh, maternal intake of gluten actually appearing to be related to offspring risk of developing type 1 diabetes in a dose-dependent fashion. So what that means is that mothers who have the highest intakes of gluten in their diet have been associated with having much higher risks of their children having this autoimmune disease, which is type 1 diabetes. So clearly there is an dose dependency there. And I think that provides a, a degree of nuance that allows people to find their own personal level. That's interesting. Yeah. I've been talking to Jeff Volick a long time ago and read his books. And, you know, he has this, yeah, there's 20 to 30% of the population that is carb tolerant, but that means that maybe 70% is not. I love this idea of different people because people always like to say, oh, you're all fake. We de debunked your diet because I can eat bread. And I'm like, no, I, I never said you can't eat bread. You know, it's just they're different people have different tolerances. And I'm glad you brought up gluten and lectins because I want to go into each of those a little more. So with gluten, I had no problem eating gluten my whole life and I still don't really have a problem. But once I stopped eating a lot of these gluten containing products, everything got better in my life. All my problems went away. I lost four inches I, off my pant sizes and chronic overuse injuries on my arms went away. So what do you think is going on? Do you think that I used to think gluten like celiac was kind of fake? too. I thought people were overreacting, but maybe everyone does have some kind of sensitivity to it, or maybe it, as they age, they get more, or something is going on there. Do you, what do you think? We have a look at something called intestinal permeability. We know that everybody has an increase in their intestinal permeability after exposure to gluten, but the difference is the, the starting point. The people with celiac disease start off with much more intestinal permeability to begin with. So they're just more vulnerable to it. So, uh, I mean, I think that's that probably illustrates why. And then to speak to your point about people who uh, think they're healthy, I frequently have patients who will come back to me and they'll say, I didn't realise that I wasn't optimal. I didn't realise that I wasn't functioning at my best. I thought I was okay because that became the new normal. In the same way that we look around our communities now, and if we see somebody a healthy body weight, they're labelled too skinny um, because we have a new normal. And that happens within our very own physiology. So if I can give you an example, people with uh, celiac disease will often describe something called a brain fog. And the reason for this is that when they uh, have gluten, they also get a damage to the lining of their stomach and often restricts how much iron their body can absorb. What little iron they are absorbing because they're chronically inflamed, you'll remember we talked about this evolutionary process where when the body's inflamed, it can't distinguish between an infection and an autoimmune cause of inflammation, so it just locks the iron away. Celiacs, if they're consuming gluten, will basically have absolute iron deficiency where they have no iron in their body or a functional iron deficiency where they can't use the little iron that they do have. And this impacts on something called their neurotransmitter synthesis. There's a group of neurotransmitters called the catecholamines, which are essential for brain function. So neurotransmitters include things like serotonin and dopamine. And if you have low levels of these neurotransmitters being synthesized, you just won't feel that good. And the classical symptom is um, of depression, in my mind, is not sadness because sadness can be explained for a lot of reasons. You might have just had a pet that's died or something like that. But what we call anhedonia, which is the loss of pleasure with activity. So let's say you really enjoy going out and playing basketball or something like that and you just don't look forward to that anymore. Well, that's very suggestive, a loss of dopamine circulating within your mesolimbic pathway. And if you actually then uh, restore that level by releasing the iron or increasing your iron levels, people will come back to me and they say, I didn't feel sad, but now I feel happier. Now I get more joy. I feel more vibrant. I have much more energy.
And there's just this gradual slide that catches people because you, you're functioning well in your 20s and it happens over decades. You know, you go to your 30s, you go to the 40s, it, it just sneaks up on people. They don't realise that you should be feeling as good in your 40s as you did in your 20s. And that I honestly believe that. I'm in my 40s myself and I feel good. This is the way that everybody should be. Absolutely. I mean, I love to bring up Mark Sisson. You know, he's 65, just out there killing it. Like, that's how we should all strive to be and how we should be. And likely our ancestors were, but we have the new normal where we think at 65, you should be retiring and everyone is, you know, in a chair and Mark's playing ultimate Frisbee with 18 year olds. Well, so yeah, I think the other problem is we don't have great tests for intestinal permeability, do we? I mean, people don't outwardly easily know that they're having these little problems that creep up over the years with gluten and other foods, right? Well, no, because the tests that we do have are very, very rarely used. We've got uh, some reabsorption tests where you can have uh, certain sugars and stuff like that. You can, in some quarters, you can do what we call a polyethylene glycol test and then see what comes out in the urine. My preferred test is called fecal colprotectin, which actually basically measures uh, byproducts of inflammatory cells um, throughout the whole gastrointestinal tract, basically from the mouth to the anus going down through the esophagus, the stomach, the intestines. And so if you have these inflammatory byproducts, they'll accumulate in the feces and we can do a fecal test and we can get a very good indication of whether you've got excessive intestinal or or it could be anywhere within the gastrointestinal tract, any inflammation. And again, this is another problem of reference range because the reference range that is set doesn't necessarily correlate with good health. So I've actually, uh, one of my friends is a gastroenterologist here in Australia, is a Pran Yoganathan, and I've had several long conversations with him and he's sort of you know, educated me in terms of the conventional gastroenterology approach. He himself is not a conventional practitioner. He's uh, very open-minded and uh, will explore um, basically the same things that I'm exploring. And I've discussed with him how I've, you know, we've had patients who have been able to get their fecal colprotectin down from the over a thousand to maybe a hundred. And then I'll say to him, "We've got a problem. What's going on? Why can't we get it lower?" And he says to me, Paul, you know what? The thing is that in our profession, in the mainstream, is that we don't aspire for perfection. We just, because we can never achieve it, that's just unobtainable with the standard medications. He was actually really loving this approach because we're not accepting that somebody with inflammatory bowel disease cannot be effectively put into remission, that we can't bring that level down to single digits or even undetectable. Interesting thing is, uh, just as a random comment, uh, one of the medications, what we actually figured out is one of the medications, it's an aspirin type derivative that people have, uh, they take to control their inflammation in this condition, can actually cause inflammation. So when you go on a super clean diet in some of these individuals, um, if they're still remaining on this medication, they will never get a uh, an optimal improvement. And we have slowly wean this medication that they're taking for their bowel inflammation to actually get optimal improvements in their bowel inflammation. That's the classic uh, modern medical problem. It's funny. Yeah. What kind of diet would you recommend to someone that had intestinal permeability problems? I mean, the low-lying fruit is gluten. You've got to cut out the gluten across the board. Anybody with autoimmune disease or any hint of inflammatory bowel disease, you're crazy. And if you keep continuing to consume it. And the thing that I have to explain to my patients is there's a big difference between a diet for autoimmune disease and inflammation and a diet for metabolic disease. Because that, that's how I tend to think of health in those, mm-hmm. two, those two paradigms. Because if you're a diabetic and your problem is high blood sugar, if I cut out 90% of the carbs in your diet and you stick to that diet 90%, then you will get a damn good improvement. But if you have an autoimmune issue and it's being triggered by certain uh, lectins, usually plant-based lectins, then if you're only 90% compliant, then that remaining dose of lectin is probably still going to be enough to keep the immune system rolling on and the, Mm. the immune response active. And I often use the example of a vaccination. You only, uh, when we vaccinate somebody against a certain disease, let's say tetanus, 
you develop an antibody response to that. And those antibodies can then circulate for a long, long period of time. You, you know, that, that's vaccines good for five or 10 years. Sometimes the antibodies have much shorter half-life. So vaccines against, say, whooping cough or pertussis, um, they're probably only good for 12 to 18 months. So they, they can fade away sooner. But the point is, if you are gluten intolerant and you say, well, I'm 90% strict, but, you know, once a month I'll go down to the local cafe and I'll have um, sourdough bread or something like that, then that's probably enough to prevent you from getting great results because the immune response can still be maintained. It can still be active. So uh, patients need to, when I educate them, it's like you go on a low-carb diet, I don't care if you're not 100% compliant. But if you're a celiac or something like that, then there is no choice but to strive for 100% compliance. It, it's not in Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And and a lot of people get too zealous or too wrapped up in, in one way of doing something because it worked for them or when they were obese and then they did it, then they're like, oh, now I need to do this forever. When it's like, well, carbs aren't evil. Maybe they're they're bad for someone who's 200 pounds overweight and diabetic, but if you go and you're thin and you're like me, I can handle carbs. It's not like I never eat carbs, you know, it's just, it's, I earn them in a way. Like I go play basketball. Like you mentioned, I look forward to playing basketball. I really want to play basketball again. I need this lockdown to end so I can play basketball, but I'll have some carbs. It's okay. Or maybe I won't. But it's all the context. I love this context discussion. So tell me more about lectins, though. I read Gundry's book. Uh, what is it called? Plant Paradox? Plant yeah. Paradox, tell me yeah. more about lectins. And did he get it all right? Did he get it wrong? What's the deal? So this is a bit of an interesting um, a book. It's sort of a, a book of two stories. As uh, Ken Berry will uh, aptly describe it, the book is schizophrenic. The first half of the book, you read it it outlines the science quite impressively about plant-based lectins and how they can be harmful to your health and deleterious to your health. And then the second half of the book is uh, encouraging people to eat plants. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny. And, and I'm being a little bit pithy there, but I, I'm actually, you know, that's pretty much a summary of the book. And what you have to understand, and I'd, I'd, I suspect this may relate to Dr. Gundry doing a lot of his early work in Seventh-day Adventist institutions, and I wonder whether a, uh, there's a, a degree of religious uh, Seventh-day Adventism coming into the book there and which just creates a little bit of cognitive dissonance, which may be why he's been unable to embrace animal foods as if you follow the logic that he presents in the first half of his book, um, you know, that, that should be the logical conclusion. What he does do certainly provides some strategies that you can do to make plant foods safer, often traditional preparation methods. And I know you're a fan of Western Price and it's like sprouting and, you know, making sure you, you slow cook things in the right way. And these preparation methods will certainly reduce the levels of these deleterious lectins in foods. But for my money, if you know that something's deleterious, if I have a choice between just reducing my intake or eliminating my intake, I know which one I'm going to take. Well, for one thing, yeah, I think a lot of the, some of these older school guys, and maybe they just happen to be older in general, they're still caught up with the, this plant-based just miracle. I just noticed some of these people that just won't give it up. And then there's a lot of people nowadays they're not necessarily carnivores, but they're just open-minded to say, hey, what if plants aren't miracle foods after all? What if they're just fallback foods that we <laughs> somehow adopted as the healthiest thing on earth? Well, I learned something very interesting yesterday. I was sent an article and it was about um, a hemochromatosis gene. So this is a gene that actually increases the risk of iron overload and it can actually be a problem. This article actually went through and made quite a convincing case that most common mutation for causing iron overload appears to have actually evolved during a period when um, grains and agriculture was becoming a, a part of our, our history and it actually seems to have been selected for to compensate for deficiencies of iron in our diet that's um, uh, 
pre-agriculture, we, our diets were incredibly high in iron. So we can actually see the impact of these diets on our health. And it's, uh, I was absolutely fascinated to see that you can actually see it in our genetic history as well. So this condition of hemochromatosis has probably been selected for based on agricultural diets. That is interesting. Wait, we should go back to lectins though. Tell us more about lectins because I don't think everyone knows exactly what foods have them and how they work. Well, let's talk. So lectins are carbohydrate binding protein. So that means it's a protein that has a capacity to latch on to a carbohydrate and understand that sugars are carbohydrates. And sometimes these can, if we have, say, leaky gut, they can be absorbed, enter our body in ways that they shouldn't and be exposed to the immune system. And if they get exposed to the immune system, they can trigger an immune response. Our body will say, this is foreign, and it will do the right thing. And it will say, I, I just need to, uh, I need to make a, have a reaction against this. Now, the problem is our cells have these little stalks called glycoproteins, which uniquely identify them. And occasionally, the protective cap of these stalks, often a sialic acid residue, can be stripped away so that the immune system can actually be exposed to our own cells. Now, if the molecular signature of these lectins actually mimics the molecular signature on these glycoprotein stalks, then we can have what's called a cross-reaction. So in medicine, we call this molecular mimicry. And this is to this day, and this is when I went through medical school, and currently this is considered to be the major reason for autoimmune reactions. So if you uh, have leaky gut and then you have absorption of these lectins and they, they look very similar to some of the cells in your own body, you can then uh, develop an immune autoimmune response where your immune system itself will actually attack your own healthy cells. You know, they basically go rogue. And so one of the prerequisites for that is obviously that they enter your body and the most likely condition that will cause them to enter your body is an inflammatory bowel disease. We know that massively disrupts the lining of the gut. And if we have a look at a genome-wide analysis of the myriad of autoimmune diseases there is, we see at the very heart of that, at the hub of this, uh, these wheels with the spokes going out, are the inflammatory bowel diseases. And if we put all of this evidence together, it makes a very strong argument that things that increase intestinal permeability and things that can potentially cross-react with these glycoproteins on our cells, and I will point out that gluten is also a lectin, these likely have a causative role in triggering immune issues. And there's now evidence. So they've done a study, for instance, in uh, females with a condition called Hashimoto's thyroiditis where they've got these antibodies that are attacking the gland in their neck. And thyroid or Hashimoto's is probably the single most common autoimmune disease that we get. And they've actually demonstrated that when these females cut gluten out of their diet, the level of these antibodies against their thyroid gland actually fell. It's certainly, when we think about the foods that these lectins are commonly found in, it includes all the grains, there is really no safe grain that I would, you know, recommend people would consume ad libitum. Now, some people can consume them safely, but if, as a population recommendation, grains are generally suboptimal. Things like your pulses and your beans and your legumes and your seeds, even nuts, these have legumes in them. And one thing that gets a lot of people on ketogenic diets are the nightshade vegetables. So things like, uh, eggplant or aubergine, uh, chili peppers, tomatoes. The nightshade family contain lectins. And a lot of people will know from personal experience that, for instance, they have an inflammatory knee um, pain that will get worse when they eat tomatoes. So in my days when I was practicing as a physiotherapist, I'd frequently see this. People will have identified that certain of the nightshade vegetables would cause their arthritis to be worse. And it was just a, a simple measure of eliminating it from the diet. One of the interesting things is, just while we're talking about arthritis, is a supplement called glucosamine. So glucosamine can actually bind to some of these lectins. So one of the most common lectins is called wheat germ agglutinin. 
if you actually take glucosamine at the same time as you're having, uh, say, some wheat bread, then the glucosamine can bind to some of this lectin before it actually gets absorbed into your body and prevent it being absorbed. And anecdotally, we know, so I'm in sports medicine, I see a lot of people with joint pains, people come in swearing black and blue that taking glucosamine will help their knee pain. But whenever we've studied it, it has always been shown to be a failure. And the reason for it being a failure in the studies is that they absolutely exclude the inflammatory type of knee pain for the studies because it's been assumed that it only benefits what we call the degenerative osteoarthritis. So we require people to have an X-ray proving that their cartilage is basically ground away before they can enter the study. And when we're studying people like that, it means that it's more of a a wear and tear, a a grinding degenerative arthritis and not an inflammatory arthritis. So we actually exclude from the study population those people who would be predicted to benefit. So uh, certainly lectins impact more people quite widely than than who absolutely realise it. And it is something that is hidden to mainstream medicine. Most doctors have absolutely no knowledge of the lectins. And I'd say full credit to Stephen Gundry, who's actually brought it to the attention of the world, even if I disagree with his response about what to do about it. Yeah. So do you have like a certain type of diet you recommend to most people or to everyone? Or obviously it matters what condition they're presenting with, but what's your diet? Maybe you can start there. What do you like to eat? Well, look, let's talk about the diet. So I think the diet that's suitable for somebody has to depend on these two parameters. It has to depend on metabolic health and it has to depend on autoimmune health. And we're getting a very good understanding of metabolic health. We can measure your insulin level. We have a look at your triglycerides. We have a look at your HDL and what's happening to your lipid parameters. We can tell if somebody's metabolically healthy or not. And if you're not metabolically healthy, we know what to do. It's don't have sugar, reduce the carbohydrates, reduce the seed oils and these kind of things. And we can absolutely get a great improvement in metabolic health. But if after testing, we find that somebody has autoimmune issues, if they've got this, uh, inflammation, background inflammation that doesn't appear to be caused by an infection or by another cause by a cancer or something like that, if they've got these circulating antibodies against different tissues in their bodies, including their pancreas or their thyroid or, you know, the joints or what have you, there's literally hundreds of different antibody tests we can do. Then if you have that autoimmune ill health, then it's not just about the carbohydrates. Then I think the lectins become incredibly important. And then you have a choice of do you just eradicate the worst foods from the diet, the ones that we can predict will be bad, the things like the wheat, the barley, the rye that contain the gluten, and then perhaps go down the nightshade vegetables and these other foods, Or do we put people on essentially what is an animal-based diet, which some people would describe as a carnivorous diet? That decision is much dependent on personal beliefs and personal attitudes as it is, you know, whatever medical recommendation I would have. I can't tell somebody to go on a certain diet if it doesn't fit with their personal ethos. The diet that I'd put on somebody who has no metabolic or no autoimmune disease but who's diabetic would be very, very different to the person with uh, celiac disease. Mm, Yeah, that makes sense. So some people I've seen on social media, they go on an animal-based diet, they're doing well, nose to tail, they're eating all, you know, the full spectrum of nutrients and bits and pieces, and they heal, and they seem to be going back. I mean, I've never been a fan of pure carnivore diet. I mean, I don't care if people do it. I just don't do it myself. But What do you think are the chances that people can heal and then add back in foods after a certain amount of time? I think it's a problem of more working out exactly what foods provoke certain people. And we're still in the infancy of this. This is a very Mm -hmm. nascent science. I think we're going to be able to one day we'll be able to look at um, a certain antibody levels and say, well, you've got these antibodies. This usually relates to these type of foods and we can do much more specific antibody testing. Indeed, we have access to pretty good antibody testing right now. Um, But for the moment, the way that a lot of people are using the carnivore-style diet is as the ultimate elimination diet with a graded reintroduction of food. So it's not necessarily that you necessarily need to go carnivore to get the benefit. But it's just that if you don't go it, then you 
you probably will still be consuming something that could be causing an exacerbation. For example, we take eggs. Some people react to egg whites, but they don't react to egg yolks. And unless you separate out the two, you will never know. You might be needlessly avoiding consuming egg yolks, which is nature's multivitamin, and potentially missing out on something. So we really, if you're going to use a carnivore diet like that, I absolutely agree that it's um, you can reintroduce some foods later on. I think that if you go too far and you say, well, I'm, I can have gluten now, I can have bread and these kind of things, I think then you're asking for trouble because certain people will never be able to tolerate those things. But there'll be things in the in the middle, something like coffee, for instance. So coffee contains lectins, so that's a seed. But there's things we can do. If you run it through a paper filter, then that very likely removes some of the lectins and will make that safer. But in the first instance, you probably should exclude it altogether. And then when you reintroduce it, you should reintroduce the filtered version. And then if you're going well then and it's, you know, you don't like the hassle of doing that, then trial reintroducing the unfiltered version and see what happens. I like that. Yeah, self-testing. What about some of the other plant anti-nutrients? I mean, I've had Sally Norton talk about oxalates and all that stuff. Do you have like kind of a hierarchy of how bad they are or how people remove them? Again, it depends on the patient. In my field, in sports medicine, we see a lot of people with arthritis and there's a con- conditions called um, crystal arthropathies, which are traditionally considered to be gout or pseudo gout, um, which have uric acid crystals, uh, calcium pyrophosphate. The problem is that oxalates can also cause this crystal arthropathy. So if you're a patient who has a lot of spinach and that's causing an inflammatory joint pain that's severe, you you have trouble even walking and eating to use a crutch, then for you oxalates is going to be the issue. But if you're a female who's iron deficient, who loves to have cups of tea, then it's going to be the anti-nutrients within the tea that is preventing you from absorbing the iron that is going to be the issue. So I think it's very difficult to give an absolute hierarchy of the word foods because it really depends on the individual. For instance, somebody might be having a, a diet that's very, very rich in iron because they're eating a lot of red meat. And if they consume tea with some of the anti-nutrients, the phytates and tannins in the tea, then it may not actually be a problem because they've, they've got enough iron coming in overall. But somebody on a borderline diet, say a vegetarian-style diet, uh, the tea might be enough to uh, push them over the edge into an iron-deficient state. Likewise, if somebody has a problem with uh, an inflammatory arthritis that's caused by oxalates, basically the oxalates can form crystals in the joints. For them, their spinach smoothie and the oxalates would absolutely be number one on the hierarchy of things to avoid. Whereas for a lot of other people, if they're not at risk of having kidney stones and they don't have a uh, an oxalate inflammatory arthropathy, then uh, oxalates are not going to be something that they even think about. So it's very, very individual. Mm, that makes sense. And just to make it clear, when you're talking about a vegetarian diet and the person avoiding red meat, they're not getting enough iron already. That was the point. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if you're not having uh, an intake of heme iron, and I, I say vegetarian because even though you can get non-heme iron in uh, some vegetarian foods, the absorption of it and the utilization of that by the body is so poor that it basically doesn't count. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes sense because some people like to kind of say that this anti-nutrient stuff is going overboard or people are paranoid or, you know, they don't understand it, but it's just because there's all these different factors and some people can tolerate them more and some people don't overdo it. Like I did overdid it years ago. I was drinking spinach and kale shakes every day. You know, I just overdid it and I got caught up in this kind of thing. And now I have a diet that's very low in anti-nutrients. I have my Sabian framework, but my little sweet spot that I've been doing for like a year is an animal-based diet with a few low anti-nutrient plant foods like avocado and mushrooms and fermented vegetables. And, you know, maybe there are some anti-nutrients that I should be aware of in some of these foods. And some people point out, oh, well, you eat onions. I'm like, well, I do okay with onions. I have no problem with onions. But 
I don't know. I think I like my way of eating now because I feel like I'm getting the benefits of some plant foods and variety, but I'm not chugging spinach every day. What do you think? For my money, I don't think there's any specific nutrient in plant foods that you can't obtain from animal foods. So I think it is possible for an animal-based diet to be nutritionally complete. I tell my patients that, you know, they want to eat some broccoli or some avocado or something like that. They do it for enjoyment. They do it for pleasure, but not because they think that they're getting some uh, missing nutrition um, that they otherwise wouldn't be getting in their diet. Yeah. Are they eating nose to tail? Are they, what is your view on, you know, getting the full nutrient spectrum with animal foods? Look, I think there's certain, we've certainly got enough, uh, anecdotal evidence that you don't need to eat nose to tail to be healthy. I think there are certain benefits. So if we have a look at something like a histamine intolerance, which you actually can have on a carnivore style diet. So people will be having aged meat or they might be having uh, preserved meats like prosciutto or something like that. Or they might even be um, on a carnivore style diet where they're consuming dairy. They might have fermented dairy like yogurt. Um, or they might be having deep water fish like sardines and mackerel, which is very high in histamines. We know that there's a, a substance called DAO, which is uh, found in offal, um, that can actually help uh, basically deal with the histamine problem. And this is, you know, found in kidneys and uh, in the liver and things like that. So there are specific advantages to nose to tail eating. But again, I think it's population dependent and I don't need to tell everybody who's on an animal-based diet who comes in, I don't say you must have liver, you must have kidney, you must have brain. It depends on their particular circumstance. Hmm. I think that's interesting. So what about fiber? I know you've done some work on fiber and dispelled a lot of the myths around there, which which I agree with. I don't think fiber is necessary. I think it's this whole story we've been told based on some anecdotal stuff. So maybe you can go into fiber. Well, I mean, this is one of the biggest dietary myths that's been out there for a long, long time. The fact that fiber is actually good for treating or preventing constipation, when in actual fact, the exact opposite is true. So when we think about what constipation is, what it boils down to, it's a problem passing something through a small hole. And now we, we wax lyrical about the capacity of fiber to bolt the stool, you know, would lead anybody to ask, well, how is making something bigger going to make it easier to pass through a small hole? <laughs> and yeah. I went looking for the evidence. There's a lot of evidence or research that's been done on the effect of fiber on the stools. And it definitely shows that it can make the stool bigger. It bulks it out. There is no evidence that it can increase stool moisture. That is a myth and that has been studied. There is evidence that it can increase transit time, which is basically how quickly things transit through the intestines then doesn't lead to any increased ease of evacuation. It doesn't make it easier to pass a bowel action. Uh, so when we actually worry about symptoms of constipation, so patients come to me complaining of bloating, bleeding, pain. These are symptoms of constipation. People don't come and say, oh, look, uh, I'm worried about my transit time. It's just a wee bit slow. Do you think you could just speed that up 24 hours? Or say that That's just nothing. People don't ask for that they don't come in and ask oh i need to have a bigger poo i don't have enough bulk because that's not important they worry about being in pain having their sleep disturbed because their tummy's you know upset overnight and when we look at these kind of things a zero fiber diet wins hands down there was one study of uh, 63 participants with idiopathic constipation and they compared them with different levels of fiber in their diet. And what they actually found that in the arm that had zero fiber diet, there was 41 of them in that arm, they had 100% resolution of all their symptoms of constipation. And this is still the only experimental design study that I've been able to identify looking at the symptoms of constipation, those things that people absolutely care about. So this notion that we actually need this indigestible substance in our diet 
for health is just fanciful. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think it's really about what you're used to, too. I think the problem is some people, they make a dietary change and your body's not used to it. And then they think that that's the end all be all right? It's like if you're eating tons of fiber and then all of a sudden you have a no fiber meal and then maybe you're a little constipated, you think that, oh my God, I need fiber, right? But it's like once people get used to it, we know thousands and thousands of carnivores that have zero fiber and they're having regular bowel movements, right? It's just yeah. you're, maybe your body needs to get used to it a little bit. Well, there's other factors that can affect the bowel movements as well. So we know that dairy, and we see this all the time, dairy tends to be very constipating for some people. We know that it can actually be metabolized. Some of the protein can be metabolized into an opiate-like substance, and we know what opiates do to the gastrointestinal tract. They slow it right down. We know that you can have the opposite. Um, we just mentioned histamines a moment ago. So histamines will cause diarrhea. So if you go onto a carnivore-style diet and you're having a lot of sardines, mackerel, or aged meats or things like that, that will certainly affect your gut function. So it's more than just fiber. Um, which has the capacity to upset the gastrointestinal tract. It's not uncommon that people with these issues, so just last week I diagnosed a case of Giardia, which is a parasitic infection that you know usually we see in people drinking mountain water. Um, we often see you know often other inflammatory conditions, a bunch of other infections in the in the intestines. So it's important that people don't have their blinkers on and think that fiber is the only thing that can uh, be affecting gastrointestinal motility. Mm. I had a conversation with Dr. David Klerfeld, who was on the WHO working group that decided meat was a carcinogen. He was against it. He was saying how there were a lot of vegans and they're ignoring studies that he brought to the table that disagreed with them. It's a whole nother story. People should go back and listen to that podcast. It was a while back. Very interesting. But he was kind of in this old school guy right? Old school paradigm. He's kind of an older man. He's got to have a well-balanced diet, you know? Meat's great, but you got to have your fiber. And he was saying, it's like you're, the mucosal wall, you know, if you don't have the fiber, you're not going to feed the bacteria in the mucosal wall of your intestines. So what do you say to that? Okay. So the way fiber works in terms of that is that because you can't digest it, it's basically a waste product as far as you're concerned, but your bacteria can. Your bacteria can ferment it. And uh, I will actually also point out that another term for f ferment could be rot. These are vegan groups who claim that meat rots in the gut. It's actually the opposite is true. The meat is incredibly well absorbed and it's actually the fiber which is eventually rotting. Off the <laughs> yeah, the it's the vegetables. Oh. Yeah, it's the, the vegetables that rot and ferment. So yeah. when the bacteria will actually ferment the fiber, they can produce something called a short-chain fatty acid. And this short-chain fatty acid can then be taken up by the cells lining the colon or the intestine, and they can actually use that for energy. But there's two key points here. So the first point is that the, this production of short-chain fatty acids is restricted to a very, very small part of the colon. So that means only very few cells of the colon can actually be benefited by this which means that if you have a, an issue, um, say, with Crohn's disease, which can affect any part of the gastrointestinal tract from the mouth all the way to the anus, then this localised production of short-chain fatty acids is not going to do you diddly squat. Number two, once these colonocytes or these cells actually take up the short-chain fatty acids, they actually then convert them through ketones which are then used to provide the cell with energy and allow it to produce more mucus and make a, a healthier barrier. So if the ketone is actually the, uh, the important thing here, I would argue that it's much more important to be in nutritional ketosis, basically having circulating ketones being delivered to every single cell in your colon rather than just this patchy uptake from short-chain fatty acid production. So... When we actually have a look at the evidence in totality, a state of nutritional ketosis is going to be far better than what little patchwork effect you can get from ingesting fiber. Mm. I was thinking about this regarding fasting, and people on all sides regard fasting as healthy. And if you're fasting for a few days, you know, not all the time, but maybe do it a couple times a year, you're getting no a fiber. You're not getting any of this mucosal lining, supposed, you know, superfood stuff 
yet you're fine and you're healthy. And that's probably because of ketones, right? Absolutely. I mean, uh, ketones are a wonderful source of energy. I mean, our brains can use ketones very, very effectively. This whole notion that you need fiber, short chain fatty acids, or an obligatory intake of carbohydrate is just absolute fanciful. Yeah. So this is interesting. This kind of leads into the microbiome. I know you talk a lot about that as well. So tell us what's going on there. I mean, the concept of the microbiome is the bacteria in our intestines, in our colon, that basically can be fed by the foodstuffs that we eat. And there's thousands of different um, varieties of bacteria. And what we eat will actually preferentially feed some of these uh, bacteria and actually lead to a wholesale change in the population. And this is a key point to understand because if we change our diet, we can literally get a wholesale change in our microbiome within a 24-hour period. And there's a lot of people out there that are thinking that our, our microbiome will actually control our health and that if we can change our microbiome, um, that will then flow on and lead to good health effects. But what they're not understanding is that the microbiome is actually just coming along for the ride. It's what we call a surrogate marker, simply a reflection of the particular diet that we're eating. And it's actually the diet that we're eating that is conferring most of the health benefits. For instance, we know that there's these two main phyla of bacteria. So you've got the Firmicutes and the Bacteroidetes. And the Firmicutes has actually been associated with obesity and metabolic ill health, and the Bacteroidetes has been associated with good health. And interestingly, when we look at people who have been on ketogenic diets to manage their epilepsy, for instance, we find that they have this Bacteroidetes predominance in their microbiome. And that's just simply a reflection of the fact that they've been on a ketogenic style diet. So I really think that these people who are arguing that uh, we need to have probiotics and so on and so forth to improve our health, there's really very, very little evidence for that. So if you take a probiotic, for instance, that is um, you know, purported to have you know, certain benefits, if you don't feed it, as in if you don't eat foods that that particular class of bacteria likes to ferment, then it will simply be outcompeted and it won't stay in the gastrointestinal tract for very long. And that's why the best evidence we have for probiotics being beneficial is in conditions like preventing traveler's diarrhea where people continually take high doses for a period of time. And what can happen then is that they continual replenishment of certain bacteria can outcompete the pathogenic bacteria. So they've done some studies in India, for instance, with a condition called necrotizing enterocolitis in infants. And they found out that if they just gave probiotics, they were not beneficial at all. So then they coined the term called a symbiotic and they would give a probiotic with a food source that would be particular to those bacteria. And when they gave infants this symbiotic, then they found it was actually quite protective. So it really comes down to the food source. And there's a classical example of this with a condition called uh, pseudomembranous colitis, which is caused by a pathogen called Clostridium difficile. And this has been a problem ever since the early 2000s. We have been having increasing numbers of cases of pseudomembranous colitis, which can actually cause massive bowel inflammation, and it actually is often fatal. So this is a pretty serious condition. And the interesting thing is that this bug in particular has an affinity for something called trehalose, which is basically a manufactured sugar. It's a sugar that can lower the freezing point of foods, which means it's often used in frozen dairy, things like ice cream. And about the year 2000, Japanese scientists figured out a way that they could manufacture it on an industrial scale. And then it gradually became introduced into the food supply around the world. And we can correlate the introduction of trehalose into the food supply with the beginning of these Clostridium difficile epidemics. And this is not junk science. This has actually been well published in nature and it's got very, very good evidence for it. So this is a, a classical case that our microbiome simply reflects 
what we ourselves eat. Yeah, I agree with this kind of idea that it's about your diet and that your a healthy microbiome is just a healthy diet, right? It's not that we need some magical, mystical, perfect microbiome that you know someone has because they're healthy. It's they're healthy and then they have a good microbiome. Yeah, and well, and the thing is, who is the arbiter of what a good microbiome is? This goes back to a, a discussion right at the very start about you know what metrics we use to assess health and we'll often see comments along the signs of you know a, a whole grain diet increases microbial diversity or something like that um, and it may do but the question is who is the arbiter that an increase in microbial diversity actually is a good thing that it leads to an improvement in health that's a good point i think part of that is some correlation between hunter gatherers and I do like using hunter gatherers as a marker of good health, but just because there's you know some Hadza group or some s group in South America eating a thousand plants species per year, and they have this super amazing gut <laughs> back microbiome supposedly, doesn't mean that everyone has to have that because there's also hunter gatherer groups that eat just meat and they have a great microbiome and they're great health. Yeah, uh, so this whole concept of diversity really baffles me. I do think that there's reasonable evidence that the overall phyla makeup, whether it's a Bacteroidetes or a Firmicutes, I think that is actually relatively scientifically based. But in terms of people saying you need to have X number of this number of species to be considered healthy, this is really not based on any science at all. And it's just a nice theory that somebody's come up with. And uh, it seems to have appealed to the um, to the mind of the public, and you know it's been republished in the media ad nauseum, uh, so much so that now people believe it. Um, but again, it's junk science. It's correlation versus causation. We know just because some people might have a more diverse microbiome, them being healthier, doesn't prove that the microbiome caused it. And just remember. I can change your microbiome literally overnight by changing your diet. Within 24 hours apart, two samples will be massively, massively different. So your microbiome is a reflection of what you eat. Nothing more, nothing less. Yeah. So before we go, I, I, in the beginning we said we'd wrap back around to some of this virus, immunity, COVID stuff. I had a great presentation online. People should check it out on YouTube. But let's see if we can wrap it up with some of that stuff really quick. Yeah, well, I mean, the interesting thing that when we're looking at it is that everybody's uh, talking about social distancing and isolation and how you can try and avoid being infected with coronavirus. And I think that's a very sensible conversation. But what nobody seemed to be talking about was how to reduce the risk to yourself if you actually get the infection, how to don a suit of armour, if you will. And when I went looking through the research, I came across some very compelling evidence one, the mortality and the morbidity associated with coronavirus infection appeared to be related to insulin resistance. And two, there seemed to be good evidence that if we can change some of these parameters through diet alone, we can actually uh, be relatively protected in short order in a matter of days or weeks. It seems like that's all we should be talking about. I mean, not all we should be talking about. We should be talking about other things, but this is seems like the greatest way that individuals can protect themselves rather than hiding in a cave. Well, I think that, you know, I mean, you know, social isolation, all these things, I mean, there's a lot of, um, there's a political narrative to that as well and that it's quite polarising. But And I think irrespective of where you, you fall within the political spectrum and what your beliefs are, I think everybody should be doing everything they can to actually, I guess, inoculate themselves against this virus, make themselves less vulnerable to actually ending up in hospital. I mean, we've seen what happened. We saw the data come out of New Orleans and we could see that the, um, the death rate in New Orleans when it was first coming out was, appeared to be, you know, about double of what was happening in New York. And there seemed to be an association there with obesity and poor metabolic health. And when we actually drill down into it, we actually see very good evidence that metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance actually does impair the immune system. And given that this is something that you can actually control with diet, 
I think it would be absolute madness for people to not try and improve their metabolic health. So we can go to a paper that was published in uh, Nature just last year. And it's got a bit of an unwieldy title, Longitudinal Multiomics of Host Microbiome Dynamics in Pre-Diabetes. But basically what they did is they followed a bunch of people for a long period of time and they measured heaps of parameters in their blood tests. And this includes whenever they got a cold or a, a respiratory tract viral infection. And what they actually found is that the initial immune response in people who were insulin resistant, but they still had normal blood sugar levels, so they weren't diabetic, they were only insulin resistant, is that the initial immune response, the signaling pathways that were essential for a viral immune response were significantly impaired in the insulin resistant folk. This includes things like interferon signaling, the Th1 pathway, IL-12 signaling, toll-like receptor signaling, and a bunch of other things. And this is very good evidence, and the conclusion of the study authors was that basically the insulin resistance represents an, Im an immune-impaired state. But then more interestingly, we know that coronavirus is actually uh, one of the ways that actually kills people is through something called a cytokine storm, which is basically an uncontrolled inflammatory state. And when we actually have a look at the cytokine levels in the participants of this study, we see that within a week after having a viral respiratory infection, healthy people start to have a falling of their cytokine levels. And by weeks, uh, you know, by about three to five weeks, it's basically negligible back down to background level. But in the insulin resistant folk, even in two weeks after infection, we didn't see any reduction in their cytokine levels. And even between three to five weeks after, they were still significantly elevated, which would seem to indicate that the risk of cytokine storm is significantly higher in people who are insulin resistant. Mm, that's interesting. Wow. Yeah. I wish we had more time because we could get more into this. Maybe we, you could come on the Sapien podcast. We're starting that up again with Dr. Gary. And I'd love to dive deeper in this and we, you know, it'd be cool to get another doctor in here and we could get more into these details. How about that? I would absolutely love to, um, for sure. I mean, we can just briefly then, you know, we can talk about, you know, what happens if you have high blood sugars because this population that we're just talking about was a, uh, an insulin resistant population. But then when you have elevated blood sugars, things go off even more. We know that the, you start to impair things like the natural killer cell function, which is the first line of defense against viruses. We know that uh, if you have a low cholesterol, which you could be having from uh, high intake of polyunsaturated oils, well, that appears to be associated with an increased risk of viral infection. So this high LDL level that people often observe when they commence a ketogenic diet appears to be protective against viral infection. There was, uh, for instance, there was one study that looked at the risk of people uh, dying from viral pneumonia, and they found that people with a low LDL level appeared to die at five times the rate of people with a high LDL level. So there's a lot of different ways that we can look at immune function and risk of dying of viral infections. But in general, ketogenic diets and their associated effects, which includes an elevation of LDL, appear to be very, very protective. I love that. It's so interesting. I was just re-listening to my interview with David Feldman, and he was talking about the LDL and the actual benefits it has to your immune system, and we've been demonizing it for so long. Yeah, and I mean, that's a real shame. This is uh, probably circling back to the start of our discussion. Um, these metrics where you know doctors tell patients that they have to have their LDL below a certain level, otherwise it's a problem. Well, this is just blatantly false. The best level of evidence we have, there was a large meta-analysis that looked at 19 studies and prospectively and looking at LDL levels and chance of dying, and 16 of those studies found an inverse relationship. That is, people with high LDL levels lived longer. And this effect seems to be even more important in the elderly population, the age groups that are being most affected by coronavirus. So it's quite unfortunate that the public has basically had the wool pulled over their eyes and a lot of this really important health information. I think uh, if we can do a bit of a take home, it's um, do your own research and don't necessarily believe somebody simply because 
they have a medical degree. The general public has an enormous capacity to understand science and to sift through what is fact and what is fiction. And I think we need to uh, give the general public uh, more trust and, uh, dare I say, more responsibility because I think the, uh, the institutions and organisations are probably failing us at the moment. I strongly agree. I think that's a great message. You know, our community is about looking at the other side and not just blindly going with what we've heard for the past 60 years because it hasn't been great. We're not in a good position as a world from all that advice. So I love that. Leave this off as a teaser for a future podcast on the Sapien Show with Dr. Gary. Thanks so much, man. We covered so many great things here. Thanks for covering all these awesome topics. And where can people find you? Yeah, well, I'm uh, I'm active on uh, Twitter, or relatively active, at Dr. Paul Mason. I've uh, got my own YouTube channel. And uh, if I could actually just mention that we're running a uh, online low-carb conference, which is going to be scheduled for the 20th of June, and we've been quite blessed to have some absolute luminaries from the low-carb world uh, who are going to be joining us. So that includes uh, uh, Professor Tim Noakes, Ivor Cummins, David Unwin, Asim Malhotra. We've got some absolute stars from the US. So it's actually going to be a cracker of a conference. So tickets are, um, are going to be available. Um, there'll be links on Twitter and uh, hopefully that will be well promoted on social media. That sounds That's, awesome. Uh, I, yeah, I'll spread the word as well. That sounds great. And I, I do apologize for having to duck off a little bit early. I've actually just got a, a patient consultation in a few minutes, but uh, it has been absolute pleasure chatting to you. I've listened to your podcast and, you know, you've got some brilliant stuff there. The uh, I, I feel very honored to actually for you to have asked me on because um, you know, of who you've had in the past and I've listened to the information that the presenters put out. And, uh, I mean, this is absolutely a, a brilliant show and uh, I'm really grateful that you've invited me on. Well, it's really great to meet you on the airplane and make this happen finally. So you added to the list of great information. And uh, we'll check back in soon. Thanks so much. My absolute pleasure. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay. How about that one? Go to sapien.org, sign up for the newsletter, check out what we're doing there. Go to nosetail.org and get all that great meat. Foodlies.org to support the film and share it with a friend. Start back at episode one and give it a review on the podcast app or iTunes. It really helps. Thanks so much and see you next week.